Welcome to episode 33 of the National Secular Society podcast, hosted by Emma Park. This episode is about secularism in Poland. Historically, Poland has long been a Catholic country. Catholicism was suppressed under the Soviet occupation from the end of World War II until the fall of the Berlin Wall. Since then, however, a new agreement with the Vatican has resulted in a greater promotion of Catholic interests. At the same time, Poland has a basically secular constitution, and public support for the Catholic Church itself has waned considerably in the wake of the child abuse scandal. Nonetheless, Poland continues to have restrictive laws about women's reproductive rights, LGBT rights also under threat. But how much public support is there for free access to abortion? What about the teaching of LGBT identities in schools? Is the trend in Poland towards greater conservatism or greater liberalism? To answer these questions and more, I will be speaking to Kaja Bricks, president of the Polish Rationalist Association, a national organization which promotes free thought, tolerance and science-based knowledge. I will then be joined by Aleksandra Mizwek, a member of the NSS Council, for further reflection. Alex is also a professional pianist and has recorded the music accompanying this episode, about which more later. I'm joined now by Kaya Bricks, who is president of the Polish Rationalist Association. Kaya, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, how secular would you say Poland's constitution is as a matter of law? And w- what is the, the relationship between the church and the state in Poland? Well, we do have definitely a separation of the state and the churches. But we definitely don't have the secularism model like the French laicite, uh, because according to our constitution, uh, the public authorities remain impartial in the matters related to religious uh, or philosophical beliefs. Uh, but at the same time, they ensure everyone's freedom to express their beliefs uh, in public. So, well, we definitely have secularism here. The problem is that at the same time, uh, the constitution mentions that the agreements that the Polish state will have with different uh, religious associations uh, will determine the, the rules of these associations. The constitution mentions that rules will be as per the agreements between the state and each religious association. And it mentions that the Catholic Church has a special agreement with the Polish state, which is the Concord, which was signed in 1993 and ratified in 1998. And this international agreement, which we have with the Holy See, well, gives lots of privileges to the Catholic Church. And today, actually for many years now, we've been discussing in Poland that it would be uh, great to change these rules because they are not in line with secularism as we would like to see it. But in order to change the, the agreements with the Catholic Church, we would have to first change the constitution. Uh, what are the special privileges? Can you give an example of, of some of the privileges which the Catholic Church has in Poland at the moment? Well, they have lots of economical privileges. They uh, don't pay taxes. Uh, They have um, received lands that have been taken from them uh, in 1950, when uh, basically all properties were nationalized. And at the same time, a special church fund was created uh, as a compensation for the church. So after 1989, there was this special commission, property commission that was giving back the properties of different religious associations, which in principle uh, was a very good thing. But the problem was that it was very corrupted and that the Catholic Church received lots of properties uh, at with fake values, which later they were reselling at uh, triple price. And they made a lot of money out of it. it. This commission was there till 2011. And members of this commission are now being prosecuted for corruption. But the, the Catholic Church is not prosecuted in any way. So they have lots of properties. They have lots of rights when it comes to charity organizations that they don't need to fulfill the the usual criteria 
And at the same time, the church fund, which was created as a compensation for the lost properties in 1950, is still in place. So uh, the state is still paying for this fund, which covers social insurance and health insurance of the priests. The, the problem with this commission, the biggest problem was that there was no appeal. So a small group of people just decided that this hospital or this school or this cinema uh, once belonged to the Catholic Church. And sometimes they actually went back to some documents from 14th century. And they decided that, okay, in the 14th century, this belonged to the Catholic Church. So now it should be uh, given back uh, to them. And there was no way to stop it. Uh, no way to appeal. So, so a large potential for, for corruption then. Um, but you, you say that um, there's been a movement to to discuss um, ab abolishing this these special privileges. What's the current situation? Because recently, of course, um, the Law and Justice Party last autumn was elected for its second term. The very conservative Catholic um, party is, and is now the um, governing party um, in, a, in a coalition in Poland. And President Andrzej um, Duda um, has just been elected for a second term, and he's a former member of, of the Law and Justice Party. H how is their um, power affecting um, the situation of the Catholic Church in Poland? Does that mean that these reforms are going to be on the back burner? Well, luckily uh, for us, uh, this government and this president, they say lots of things, uh, which usually are something you wouldn't like to hear. But legally, they haven't done many changes. So either they are not capable of doing them, or maybe they don't really want to make them mm, real as much as they like to speak about these things. Uh, definitely the climate changed a lot uh, in Poland in the sense of the, the church is heard more. Uh, one of the first things that this uh, government did was changing the role of the public media, which basically turned into a propaganda tube of the government. We actually used to have a problem with that even before, that it was always too much connected to the ruling party, the, the public TV especially. But uh, since law and justice is in power, they have openly made it their propaganda tube. And they have given more time for the Catholic Church representatives. They have a lot of films, documents that are supposed to teach Catholic values. But actually, they do it a I mean, having it as a propaganda tube, this is definitely not right. But the Christian values, they are there in the, in the rules for the public TV. As decided in uh, 2009, that the public TV should actually support Christian values. It was decided by the parliament in, in 2009, when Civic Platform was uh, in power. Okay, so it's been around for, for quite a long time, but I mean... You say that um, this this government is is currently talking more than it's acting. What is, what is that in relation to? Because I mean, it's certainly the case, isn't it, that they're very much opposed to things like um, certain liberties, like women's reproductive rights, LGBT rights, and they've sought to sort of undermine the independence of the judiciary. I mean, how how far has this had practical effects? Well, definitely the independence of the judiciary. This is uh, this, the most serious issue. They have changed the way the National Council of the Judiciary works. So the council which nominates judges and they have just terminated the, the term of the current members of this council and they appointed new ones. And ever since this new council appointed by the current parliament has been uh, appointing new judges. At the same time, they have introduced a bill uh, which says that uh, you cannot be a judge anymore after six, uh, six, once you're 65 years old, which is quite absurd. In this profession, the, um, there are many, many judges who actually uh, work all around the world uh, at their 70s and 80s and even older, because what matters is their expertise. Um, so they are actually considered very valuable. It is the idea with, with reducing the age limit to 65 that they will then be able to replace judges more quickly with their own preferred candidates. 
Yes, although as an explanation from their side, well, they used the argument that many of these elderly judges were actually related to the communist regime, which we had pre-1989 in Poland. And some of them actually, well, were responsible for for what happened to the opposition, for uh, incarcerations, even for uh, for deaths of people. The problem is that we don't know exactly which of these uh, judges were responsible, uh, but that was the that was the argument which uh, many Polish people accepted. That yes, these people were uh, related to that regime, and now they are still uh, judges, and uh, some of them actually are criminals themselves. It's a good sort of. Um pretext potentially yes but but of course it meant that a lot of judges were now replaced with younger people who are not by the new council how far have, have these reforms um in practice how far have they meant that it is say more difficult um for women to get an abortion in poland have, have people who are lgbt found themselves um more under pressure as a result of these changes and as a result of the current atmosphere in Poland? Let's talk maybe about the the abortion, the health and reproductive rights first, because actually I think there is a, quite a big misconception uh, regarding this topic abroad, because this government has actually not done anything to make the situation of women worse. We had civic bills. This is very interesting. So the the projects of these bills to uh, abolish abortion completely, they came from c- civil society. C- so Catholic organizations, basically, who got enough signatories to submit these projects uh, to the parliament. And there was this very, very horrific project, which was submitted in uh, 2017, that was to ban abortion completely. And also there was this point about, in case of miscarriage, there should be a prosecutor involved to investigate whether it was done on purpose or not. And there was a penalty of uh, jail meant for women who would have done an abortion. Uh, So this was really horrible bill. And this is why we had these huge protests, black protests. I'm sure you've heard about them. Yeah. And they were successful in in overturning or preventing that bill from coming into law. Yes. And luckily, this bill uh, was rejected by the parliament. Do you think there's a possibility that such a bill might might be um, raised again and be passed successfully? There is another project done by the same organization, which has been submitted to the parliament recently. But this project is very different, luckily. I mean, it's still not good. And I hope they will reject it again. For now, it's been moved to the commissions, uh, where it may remain for a few years, in fact, before the parliament uh, decides on it. So at the moment, we still have the same law about the reproductive rights, which we have since 1993, uh, which says that in general, abortion is illegal. But there are three exceptions which are accepted, and that's in case the woman's life is endangered or there is severe fetus uh, disease, genetic disorder, or in case of uh, rape. So it's, it's still pretty restrictive. But I mean, what, what is the organization which is trying to um, put forward an even more restrictive bill? The organization's name is Ordo Iuris. Oh, it's Ordo Iuris. Okay, yes. right. So, so the very traditional Catholic um, conservative organization. Yes, but there are a few more um, similar organizations in Poland. So they actually joined forces for these uh, projects. Uh, and and so, do they want the same thing? Do they still now, are they still pushing um, in this new bill? Would it be for an, another effective completed ban, ban on abortion? They have given up for now uh, on pushing for total ban on abortion which clearly shows that actually the political climate is not to, to ban it completely. I still hope that uh, this, this project will be rejected as well. But um, we have managed to defend the status quo for now, which is, well, not that bad. Uh, but of course, we can expect new projects as well in the future. I mean, th- this is a kind of uh, fight that might continue for decades. 
What, what is the Polish Rationalists Association's um, stance on abortion? What would you like to see the law becoming? Well, we would like to see a free, free access to abortion. That's th- that's what we believe would be the best for a woman to choose freely uh, whether she would like to continue with the pregnancy or not. How, how much support does that view have in Poland at the moment? I would say not much. I was there at the black protests and I interviewed lots of people at the time because I was interested in knowing their opinions. So I did a poll about whether these people who are protesting against the, the abortion ban, would they like to have a free access to abortion in all cases or whether they would prefer the, to remain with what we have right now? And, um, well, 90% of these women who were protesting actually preferred the current status quo. How high a proportion of the population is, um, is Catholic? It's hard to say. Well, officially it's 93%, but here we are talking about people who are baptized. And in fact, when we look at the statistics that the Catholic Church does, about 40% of these people go to the Sunday Mass. So there's a big gap there. Yeah, so we would say that most people in Poland are baptized and they probably celebrate Christmas and they do believe in some sort of God and maybe an afterlife, but they are not that much connected to to the Catholicism itself and they are, don't feel connected to the church. In fact, uh, recently the um, pedophilia topic uh, arose finally after so many years of being uh, covered. This huge scandal really changed the way the Polish people perceive the Catholic Church today. So, yes, definitely from the side of the government, you can feel that, they, of course, they are very conservative and very religious, and the way they say things, well, I really don't watch the public TV anymore because I can't stand it. But uh, Luckily, the society is changing for the better. Uh, let us um, move on to another problematic issue in Poland at the m- moment, which is the imposition um, of LGBT people and, and others. W- what's their situation? Is, is it um, because um, recently there have been some um, cities in Poland, haven't there, which have proclaimed that they're LGBT free? Yes. Well, precisely. Uh, they proclaim that they are free of LGBT ideology. We, the, I know it's, <laughs> it's still it's still bad, uh, but it, there is a small difference between that because when you hear LGBT free, you have immediately, or at least I have this association that you have these signs in the restaurant that uh, LGBT people cannot enter and stuff like that. Basically, the battle here is about sexual education in schools and any presence of LGBT associations or or NGOs that fight for LGBT rights, um, that any presence of them would be uh, not allowed in schools. So it's mostly about education. Catholic Church has uh, some power over education in Poland. We have the Catholic religion uh, classes at schools. Do, do you have Catholic religion classes at all schools in Poland? Yes, at all public schools we have Catholic religion. Uh, there is an option for, for other religion classes as well, in case there is a minority uh, that would request such lessons. So uh, in, there are some regions in Poland where you have other religions taught at schools as well. What, what would the major other ones be? Well, other versions of Christianity. <laughs> so the Orthodox Christianity and the Protestant Christianity. I'm not sure if there is um, if there are any lessons of Judaism. In, in these schools where there is Catholic religion taught, is, is it taught that... Uh, being LGBT is is wrong? Definitely, yes. So that's the problem, that uh, actually according to Conquer That, we need to have these uh, Catholic religion classes at schools. They are optional, so the, the pupils don't have to participate in them. But there has always been a huge social pressure to participate. And this is one of the things that we have been fighting as Polish Russianist Association. Um, so uh, 
for example, we opposed the um, this habit that was there that pe people who didn't want to send their children to these classes would actually have to opt out from religion. Uh, so we pointed out that you need to opt in if this is an optional subject uh, and not that it's it looks as if it's mandatory by the fact that they subscribe your child automatically and you need to opt out. So this has changed for the better. And you managed to get it to be a proper opt-in rather than opt-out. Yes, but there are still probably some schools uh, where it doesn't work as it should, but in majority of schools it's changed. In the last decade there, be, there has been a huge progress. Also the, cla the classes of ethics has been introduced as an alternative. Uh, but still the problem is that, um, that the religion classes, the subjects which are taught are completely decided by the church. The state or the Ministry of Education or the school principal have absolutely nothing to say about what's taught in these classes. At the, at the same time, it's the state that's paying the wages of these teachers, uh, but they are appointed by bishops and uh, and the, the school principal cannot even fire them if they misbehave. The principal would need to ask the bishop to replace that teacher with another teacher. So this is really bad. And yes, there have been incidents of, well, in general, the Catholic Church teaches, of course, that sex before marriage is a sin, that homosexuality is a sin, that abortion is a sin, that uh, masturbation is a sin. So these are the um, standard topics. Now, uh, of course, different priests would teach about this in different ways. There are some that are more tolerant. So they wouldn't, well, they, they wouldn't even discuss it too much with children. They would move on to other topics. But there are some who definitely use uh, hate speech in these classes. Uh, there have been some instances also of anti-Semitism that was taught in, in these classes. And these cases were reported by the parents who were concerned, even religious parents. Yes, we have uh, a lot of religious people who still would prefer that the society is tolerant. So there, there is a huge public debate about this. Would you say in Poland in general, there is tolerance of LGBT people in, in most parts of the country? Or would you say that it's a, a mixture of some intolerance? I wouldn't go that far to say that we as a society in general are very tolerant uh, in this regard. I can say that it has changed a lot in the last 20 years that the 21st century marks for me a huge progress. And ever since we joined the European Union, it has changed definitely for the better. And the fact that young people are exposed to values that come from other European countries is very important. So among young people, you definitely see um, a big tolerance. But in, in other generations, well, it depends. It also actually varies regarding the um, regions in Poland. So there are some regions which are in general more conservative and more religious. And yes, I have to add regarding these LGBT ideology free zones that even though it focuses, uh, this bill focuses on education at schools, that they don't want any thing related to uh, sexual orientation or gender to be taught at schools. They would prefer to keep the, the Catholic narrative. There is a potential in these regulations that it could change for more discrimination. It actually varies also from place to place, the exact text that was approved by the council. So in some of them, you could understand that the LGBT um, associations will not be given any funding, uh, that they cannot apply for grants, or even it might mean that they will not be able to do um, equality marches uh, or other public organized um, demonstrations. When, when was the latest in le legislation introduced? Well, it started at the end of last year and mainly it's this calendar year some uh, local councils you mostly in small towns 
have approved such pieces of legislation for their local structures. I see. So the idea is basically to try and shut down um, LGBT rights groups and prevent them. From... Yes. However, you can also see how this has actually encouraged supporters of tolerance to speak against the government, to speak against uh, these local councils, to demonstrate for LGBT rights. And currently, I know that the left-wing party, which is in the parliament, is preparing another bill uh, project for civil unions. It will be the ninth time that this topic uh, is raised in the parliament. Do you, th do you think it's likely that this bill will go through this time, given that the right-wing parties, the United Right, are currently in power? I don't think so. But um, it's very important, actually, to see how other people will vote. Because you see, the problem is that when the civic platform was in power, there were also projects of, uh, of the civil union uh, legalization at that time, and they voted against it. Most of, most of the um, members of the parliament from the civic platform voted against it because they were also very conservative and religious. And, and just for listeners, the civic platform was the coalition of more sort of centrist parties that was in power before. Uh, yes, but they were very conservative. This is something we forget because they have changed now. As, um, as an opposition to law and justice, they have become much more tolerant, much more progressive. What, what you're saying is that actually the, the, the greater conservatism of the um, law and justice party has actually pushed um, the civic platform the other way. Yes, that's definitely what happened. Uh, and because... See, now in this presidential elections, we had the candidate from the civic platform, uh, Rafał Trzaskowski, whose one of the main points in the agenda was, was the fight for the LGBT rights. And the second one was the reproduction rights of women. He didn't have a long agenda for the elections. These were the two main topics for him and the general tolerance. And he was the second candidate. Uh, he was the one in, uh, who in the second round was against uh, Andrzej Duda. And he received around 49% of votes. So yes, Andrzej Duda was re-elected. But if you look at the numbers, they, the two candidates were so close to each other. So it actually shows that in a way, the conservatism of law and justice is somehow uh, motivating other people to become more progressive and more tolerant. I really see this process and this process gives me hope. Although at the same time, I'm still a bit frightened about what the law and justice may do, because what they did with the judiciary system is uh, quite concerning. And if they continue doing similar things, this could be potentially dangerous. But the, the change in the society, I see it for the better, really. Well, that, that's very encouraging. What, what do you think are going to be the main challenges for your organization, the Polish Rationalist Association, during the rest of the current um, government's term and the rest of Andrzej and um, Duda's term in office? Well, it's very hard to say because it's hard to predict what, what they would do. And also it's very hard to say whether there will be some new bill projects uh, that come from this very right-wing religious uh, organizations like Ordo Iuris. So, of course, any initiative from their side would be a huge concern for us. Is there anything that you, that, that you think they might be likely to or that they've been muttering that they might introduce that you particularly fear? The most endangered group... Um, might be the LGBT. So we'll see how this whole situation evolves. Because uh, if, for example, they are not allowed to demonstrate anymore, that's already a huge thing. Because regarding their presence at schools, to be honest, it wasn't even there almost. In, in most of the schools, they were not allowed before. Uh, as same as any civil society organizations actually were not very much present at Polish schools. So, so in fact, there are some people who say that uh, the initiative to actually in, in, invite them to some of the public schools to give some lessons about tolerance, that was something that motivated the religious organizations to create this idea of LGBT ideology free zones. But, but that's, for you, that's not the, the most important problem, is it? I mean, it's, it's more in society, the, the 
suppression of, of LGBT voices. Is that right? Yes, that, that's correct. But we, we are concerned uh, with this, of course. So uh, if they are su suppressed even more, uh, well, we will definitely speak about it. Well, we will definitely continue what we are doing right now. So we focus a lot on education. We organize uh, conferences. We organize free lectures, uh, open debates about science about uh, social issues. We organize a big festival, uh, Darwin Dates, along with universities. We uh, try to encourage a dialogue. This is something that's uh, missing completely now in Poland. But how far are your discussion forums, your conferences, your, your Darwin Days and um, interactions with the university? What, what success are you having so far? Well, the Darwin Days are very popular and this is the only such initiative in Poland and we have hundreds of people who come to the lectures and we have debates and we have videos that are available then uh, for people and uh, it, it is a huge impact. So we are trying to create space basically for free thinking, for dialogue. Uh, this is what we are trying to show tolerance, we try to show uh, what science says on, on several topics. In the past, we fought a lot with the privileges of the church, and especially we tried to diminish this role of the religious classes. Uh, so we fought for the ethics class to be introduced. We were not the only organization, of course, that fought for it. So it's not just our credit, uh, but um, we are very happy that this actually was accomplished. That's great. You, you seem to be having um, quite a lot of success so far, um, which, which is very encouraging. Just just one final question, uh, Kaya. What do you think secularist organizations in different countries, what do you think such organizations can learn from each other? Well, I think we can learn a lot. Um, first of all, uh, that secularism has so many different faces in, in different countries. And uh, some challenges are similar, so we can see how these were dealt with uh, in the past in, in other countries by other organizations. We can share also our experience. Secularism is something that's um, a very basic thing for the society to function. If we have a multicultural society, secularism is the only guarantee for tolerance to ensure that the rights of all people are in place. I think that the more we learn from other people, the better we can make our societies. So I definitely look forward to further cooperation. Kaya Briggs, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm joined now by Alexandra Mizwek. Um, Alexandra has been a member of the NSS Council since 2019. She's currently a fellow at Trinity Love and specialising in piano accompaniment. She also works as a school teacher at primary and secondary school level. Alex, first of all, the music you were playing today, this was um, for the recording, this was Frédéric Chopin's Ballade No. 4 in F minor, Opus 52. Why did you choose this piece of music? Well, hello. Um, first of all, I chose this piece of music simply because it was with me for a very long time. Uh, I learned it when I was quite young and it was actually at the moment when I was changing a little bit my own beliefs and it stayed with me uh, until now. And the piece, of course, is by a Polish composer, Chopin, um, which, you know, gives a little bit of the, I guess, patriotism in a good sense of the word to the picture. <laughs> We could talk about this for a long time, but let's just move on to the National Secular Society um, issues. Um, now, you have recently been involved with Keith Porteous Wood um, in drafting an NSS submission to the UN, um, in particular to the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was a, an alternative report on Poland. What exactly were you and Keith hoping to achieve by this? I was simply helping Keith with all the resources and translation because we were under um, the impression that a lot of things happening in Poland or the detail uh, behind uh, certain issues might not reach um, the convention simply because of the language. So we want the uh, convention to be more aware of the problem so they can 
later in turns, you know, ask Poland to clarify certain things or to improve certain things. What I was also doing, I was trying to um, contact lots of organizations and individuals in Poland who are simply unaware of um, the possibility to submit certain uh, uh, reports or, or, you know, simply their views on things, uh, again, because of language issues or, or, you know, perhaps education issues. And I encouraged other organizations to write into the convention simply so they have a very full picture and they can know what's happening and in a very practical, efficient manner, ask Poland to fix what needs to be fixed. Now, I was talking to Kaya just now about some of the issues um, facing Poland and under the government of, of the Law and Justice Party and President Duda. And the NSS submission covered quite a lot of those issues. In particular, you were focusing on the issue of education of children, specifically with um, regard to the provision of LGBT teaching. And then Keith was focusing on issues of child abuse in the Catholic Church. So what were your particular points that you were trying to make in this document? Well, the main point that I was trying to make is that the Catholic Church went too far with influencing education. And of course, the sex education is, you know, most influenced by it simply because of the set of values that the Catholic Church is trying to push. And my big belief is that you know, the very early education is extremely important simply to develop certain tolerance or certain open-mindedness and also, you know, in, in, in children, but also to give them a sense of their own rights. And my unfortunate, my view is that the church is attempting to deaden and to somehow mute this part of education and to influence it uh, too much, which, you know, we wouldn't let happen in any other subjects, you would hope. What what in particular is the church doing? So they basically push um, the ideology of what is wrong and what is right, ignoring the specialists and ignoring the scientific or psychological advice that we well should be following really in schools. In particular, they they avoid teaching about um, LGBT topics. Oh, exactly. I mean, you know, if you are lucky, you will simply have nothing about the LGBT, which is already bad enough because you can't just exclude children from knowing uh, things about themselves even. Um, that's already bad. But what they also do, or at least they, they allow it, <laughs> which is bad enough, um, they often say, you know, that the LGBT um, community or, or ideology, as they call it, should be cured and it's evil. And of course, children's minds are really easily influenced and that causes a huge mental health crisis among young people. Is, is this something that, that is happening in Poland now that, that um, Poland is really seeing children who've been influenced in this way by the Catholic Church develop and, and have problems? Yes, absolutely. Sex education in itself doesn't actually exist. What we've got is so-called education in family life. Um, and that gives you a clue what the church is trying to do, uh, or, or the government, if you like, at the moment, because the family, by Polish Catholic standards, is a man and a woman. And that's it. So if you've got it, um, well, the marriage of, of a man and a woman, of course. So if you've got a subject in schools that is called education in family life, it automatically excludes um, the LGBT community. Now, Kaya was altogether quite positive, um, I think, overall about the future of Poland. Um, and she said that there was quite a lot of resistance to the conservatism being pushed by the current government and the Catholic Church. Would you agree with that? There is a lot of resistance and some institutions work extremely well in Poland. And there, there is a resistance, especially from big cities, um, from the legal uh, community and from young people as well and we hope that the more extreme behavior we see from religious extremists really and right-wing politicians as well the more kind of a liberal or center ground person <laughs> will be willing to protest. Finally Alex did you have any other comments or, or reflections on what Kaya was saying? Well Kaya touched on uh, very many important issues, um, but she uh, might have also uh, noticed that, you know, in Poland, we've got fantastic 
free press still. Um, we've got uh, our ombudsman, who is a bit of a hero at the moment, for, for example, being able to sue some of the municipalities that were declared LGBT free zones and winning. So what, what exactly is his role? Uh, well, he is the human rights uh, ombudsman, simply, and he is a very liberal person. Uh, he's a professor of law. And at the moment, he is one of the last sort of people standing in, in this kind of public uh, world that is very, very strongly against the conservative Catholic ideology. And he, apart from being a fantastic lawyer and quite a powerful person he also organizes you know educational events he cooperates with universities and he's quite bold essentially in his movements against well i don't want to say conservative government i guess because perhaps that offends somebody but the government in poland at the moment right um, and, and what's his name um adam bodnar and just just looking forward, um, Alex, from your point of view, what, what are the next steps of the NSS going to be in regard to Poland? We, we will see, because um, unfortunately, uh, what happens in Poland at the moment is quite similar to what happens in other countries that are swallowed by the nationalist ideology, and that is fighting against the liberal values, the, the, the West, for example. So you will be pleased to know that uh, Britain or even the conservative British government is called Marxist in Poland. But that sounds quite crazy from a <laughs> yes. British person perspective. Like, yeah. Exactly. So, so in a way, you know, the NSS it should probably lend knowledge, if anything, to Polish organizations that work in the same vein and, in, you know, we try to achieve the same things. But we can't hope that the NSS itself can be somehow influential in Poland because by definition, is the liberal Western evil. Um, but I guess the cooperation should be and could be perhaps enhanced so the Polish organisations can learn from our knowledge here. Alexander Mizwak, thank you very much. Thank you very much. This episode was produced by the National Secular Society. All rights reserved. The views expressed by contributors do not necessarily represent those of the NSS. You can access the show notes and subscriber information for this and all our episodes at www.secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. For feedback, comments and suggestions, please email podcast at secularism.org.uk. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave us a positive review wherever you can. The National Secular Society works for the separation of religion and state. It campaigns for an equal respect for everyone's rights so that no one is either advantaged or disadvantaged on account of their beliefs. Find out more and add your support at secularism.org.uk. Thanks for listening and hope you can join us next time. <laughs>